and um, cheer you up a little bit by talking about law. Uh, so let's see how it goes. But before I start, I just want to take a moment for some thanks to um, everyone who worked so hard to put this together. Unlike complex systems, conferences like this are not self-organizing, and I think the organizers did a fantastic job in the support, and everyone who is here, it's just been fantastic. It's really, I think more than any other conference I've been at, has made me think constantly throughout the conference. But like complex systems, it exhibited emergent behavior, right? So some of the things that came out during the different panels were really unexpected in my mind, and I've tried to maybe weave a little of that into the presentation that I prepared for today. Okay, so um, I thought maybe it might be helpful to start with some definitions. We've talked about two words quite a bit today. One, and throughout the conference, one is governance. So um, I just pulled one kind of uh, definition of governance there. Um, Governance is, is, at least as I'm using, and I think most people use it, is a broader term than what we tend to think about regulation traditionally. So we're, we're talking about structures or institutions or approaches that influence, intentionally influence behavior, right? And it, it can be from a government agency, it can be from private entities, it can be from informal networks that have formed. So that's the, the concept I'm using. Now, most of what I talk about today is going to be in the regulatory setting where there's a government involved. Uh, but all of what I say, I think, can be applied also in kind of the soft law or private setting as well. Um, and then there's this notion of complexity. So uh, I think it's, for me, it's more helpful uh, to think uh, in terms of complex systems rather than the, 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 the concept of complexity itself. And the, uh, the definition I have up here is fairly similar uh, to what Wendell talked about. The one thing I would perhaps emphasize a bit more is the notion of autonomous agents making decisions, right, operating within that network frame. And those are the things, these interactions with each other and with other parts of the network and other embedded networks that lead to these outcomes. Uh, and that's going to become important a little bit later. And of course, as we've, we all know, there's certain aspects of these networks that are particularly important. This notion of emergence or unpredictability, nonlinearity, small changes resulting in uh, major differences in outcomes, and the self-organizing uh, nature of it. Okay. All right. So. Um, one thing I wanted to do is just briefly address this notion of the difference between complicated and complex. Um, uh, George had made that point on the very first day, and uh, conceptually, obviously, from an analytical standpoint, it's a legitimate and accurate statement. I think from in my world, in the world of where we're trying to take these notions and translate them, operationalize them into regulatory structures, uh, it becomes much less important. Uh, primarily because even complicated systems are embedded in complex systems, right? So when you're trying to govern those, uh, the difference becomes much less important. So let me give you an example. This is a before and after picture of the uh, Chevron refinery in Richmond, California. And, uh, I think it was last summer. Uh, this is what it looked like, right? So some people look at what goes on at a refinery and they may say, well, that's a complicated system, but it's not a complex system. Right? Even Perot himself in, uh, in uh, the notion, when he talks about the notion of uh, normal accidents, kind of looked at refiners and said, that's not the kind of complex interactivity that I'm thinking about. Right? But when you look at what goes on at a refinery, right, it's not just a complicated technology. It's a complicated technology embedded in multiple interactive systems, the administrative and social system of the employees and management at that particular facility, embedded in the larger corporate system and the larger industry sector, and embraced within systems regarding you know, legal and social uh, activities, right? So the things that happen at these, uh, at these complicated technological uh, junctures are still really need to be dealt with through a governance system that takes into account complexity and complex systems. So I want to make three points today. Okay, the first point, uh, which obviously everybody already knows, is that law, broadly defined to include soft law, uh, offers a variety of these governance approaches for complex technologies or systems. And I'll talk about them very briefly, and I'm going to focus on one in particular. Right? The second is that governance itself is more complex than most people think. It is a complex system, but 
in ways that I think, uh, unless you're engaged in it and trying to affect it, that maybe you don't appreciate as much. And I, I want to try and maybe uncover, unpack a little bit of that. And then lastly, other complex technologies can be used in the policy setting to assist us in addressing these complexities that we're facing. Right? And of course, the, the beat goes on because then there's complexities, complex systems that affect the use of those. So I'm going to give you some examples of that that I've seen in some of the work that we've been doing. All right. So uh, I think later on, some folks are going to talk about adaptive management and different ways of dealing with complexity. I want to focus on one in particular, which is this notion of trying to deal with complexity by, by uh, uh, taking it head on. Right? So, Harkening back to the refinery example, right? There is multiple schools of thought, disciplines that think about safety in complex systems. So you have the normal accident uh, approach coming out of Perot's work. We have uh, uh, highly reliable organizations, right? Which uh, thinks more about safety culture. We have the systems approach that thinks about safety as an emergent property and then tries to build using various uh, models based on systems analysis and systems dynamics to deal with that. Right? One thing that all of those have in common is this notion that it is possible perhaps and even uh, prefer preference, it would be a preference to attempt to simplify the system to the extent that we can prevent the existence of the risk in the first place. Right? Then the complexity, the unpredictability becomes less of a concern if what we've done is remove some of the more uh, toxic materials or processes, right? So I want to look at that as a governance approach, the notion of what I call prevention-based regulation, and then see how complexity, these notions of complex systems, kind of play into uh, the deployment of that as a regulatory approach. So uh, the central principle behind a prevention-based regulation is to avoid the risk by avoiding the chemical or the process or the uh, particular concern that you have. And what, was that, what would that look like? Well, it seeks to minimize hazardous, hazardous chemicals and materials by mandating, now we're talking about governance mechanisms, right? Or directly incentivizing the adoption of these safer, more viable alternative chemicals and processes. Now, we may be talking about safer design of nanotechnology. We may be talking about, as uh, Adam Finkel did yesterday, thinking about uh, various approaches to synthetic biology in which we do a comparative assessment of this new emerging technology to existing technologies and try to find one that on balance taking into account all we know and what we don't know is likely to be the safest approach. So this is the, uh, the, the regulatory approach that I'd like to look at and then explore a little bit, well, how does complexity help or hinder uh, that kind of regulatory uh, focus? So, if we take prevention seriously, if we're going to build it into our regulatory system, we've got to think at least about two particular elements in particular, right? The first is we need some type of methodology or approach for identifying a safer, viable alternative or set, right? The second thing is we need to have some kind of mechanism for driving the adoption of those alternatives that maybe we do identify. Now, I'm going to look at each of these uh, in series and then take a look at the complexities that uh, may be obstacles to these elements and then also the complex systems or complex technologies that might help us hurdle those obstacles. All right. So the first, the methodo methodological. How do we identify the safer alternative? So let, it, it, if we want to make it a little simple, think about the last time you bought a car, right, or selected a, 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 a job or picked a college. You know, any of your life uh, experiences, we've all engaged in trying to do essentially looking for the best alternative. And we have different methods for doing that. Essentially, we're, we're going to identify certain criteria that are important to our decision. If it's the car, right, it's going to be how fast it is, how much it costs, fuel mileage, right, uh, safety, depending on your individual preferences. And then you're going to balance those in some way. You're going to use some technique to do that. Well. Identifying a safer, viable alternative is no different than that, right? It's just done in a regulatory context, and we hope it's done a little bit more objectively and rigorously than many of us make our individual decisions, right? You can, I'm sure you can all imagine situations where you've made a decision and maybe you didn't use the most rigorous decision approach for it. We've got multiple 
uh, methods and met uh, for doing this. So if we think about trying to identify safer processes, you know, either chemical processes or, you know, what is the safest, most viable approach for uh, manufacturing carbon nanotubes, right, or the best way to configure a refinery or chemical plant. In those, we have, over the years, developed various methods, technology options analysis associated with, uh, with Nick Ashford. More, uh, uh, more recently, inherently safer design has become an important methodology for that. In the product area, when we're looking at different types of products, alternatives to lead and solder, right, or uh, bisphenol A as a plasticizer, right, we have different approaches. Within the private setting, echo design is uh, one type of method. In the regulatory setting, alternatives analysis has been the emerging method. And it's one that is, being, is now at the cutting edge of regulatory approaches. So in Europe, under the REACH regulation that covers chemicals, Manufacturers are actually engaging in alternatives analysis, doing exactly what I'm talking about. In California, we have a program for safer consumer products that requires manufacturers to look at what they put into their product and to identify if there are safer, more viable alternatives. The National Academy of Sciences has a committee right now that's attempting to essentially duplicate what was done with risk assessment with respect to uh, alternatives assessment, generate kind of the red book for alternatives assessment. So it's really a timely uh, issue that we have to deal with, but uh, it raises some real questions of complexity. So let me give you a specific example. What I have up here is a type of anti-foul anti -foul and marine paint. It's what people put on the bottom of their boats to make sure that things don't grow on it and slow the boats down. In the old days, they used a material that was really nasty, and it was phased out and replaced with copper-based paint, which we've now discovered is not such a great idea either, since the very thing that kills stuff that sticks to the bottom of your boat also kills other things that we find in marinas, right? So in California and nationally, we're looking for alternatives to that. So how do we make that decision among the various alternatives, right? We're doing a case study right now that looks at this, and one of the things on the market right now is an alternative that uses uh, nanocopper particles to uh, replace uh, uh, what we might call bulk copper. Another product uses a different type of nanomaterial. Another uses an organic material. How do we judge when we phase out the existing uh, types of paint? How do we judge whether what is being, that's being replaced with is really safer or more viable? Well, we need some decision criteria, and the typical suspects that usually come up in alternatives analysis are what I have up here. And you'll note that, you know, these are a wide range, right? Not only are we just talking about, from an environmental standpoint, human health, ecological, and environmental impacts, but we also have to kind of think about the viability aspect of it, right? The technical performance and the economic impacts, both with respect to the individual company or industry sector, but society more broadly. So what do we do in alternatives analysis? Well, we need to collect performance data on each of these alternatives, right? And then somehow have a way of evaluating them, reaching some judgment about the inevitable trade-offs that will occur. And note, these trade-offs don't just occur in terms of uh, taking a reduction on technical performance in order to get more human health, right? Even within these, law, these criteria I have here, we're gonna make, have to make choices about whether we're more willing to deal with endocrine disruption, right, or carcinogenicity. So we need to have some tool that allows us to make that evaluation, and then we'll be able to come up with some relative assessment of the safety and viability. And in many cases, we will be looking to rank these. So uh, in this particular situation, then, we're going to need some type of methodologies, and they are being developed. In fact, one of the things we're doing in our case study is testing out various methodologies we've developed at the Sustainable Technology and Policy Program. But we've got two major complexity challenges here. One, alternatives analysis is basically risk assessment on steroids, right? If you're worried about the efficacy and fairness, equity, transparency of risk assessment, think about it. That involves looking at one chemical being used in one process or product. Alternatives analysis requires you to look at multiple products and multiple chemicals, right? It is a very complicated and perhaps even complex decision that you're going to be making because of these surrounding questions. So what can we do about that? One of the possibilities is to uh, take advantage of complex systems that are being developed around predictive toxicology. So the things we have learned about systems biology 
merged together with bioinformatics and big data, now allow us to make faster, cheaper assessments of the toxicity, relative toxicity of products. I don't have enough time to go into kind of the underlying theories and methods that it, uh, are available right now. Clearly, it's not a silver bullet and much needs to be done about it. But our knowledge, the knowledge that we're developing about complex biological systems and our ability to engage in the co computational activity that was unthought of 30, 40, 50 years ago may actually be a way of solving the complexity associated with alternatives analysis. What I've put up here is just one approach that's being developed at the Center for Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology uh, back at UCLA. So there's our complex challenge number one. But suppose this actually will work, right? We're still then faced with a, a different complex system, the regulatory system and social systems that deal with how we function when we think about toxicology and regulation. So will these methods that allow us to do this kind of assessment actually take hold and be deployed in the regulatory setting? That raises all sorts of issues about how individual regulators, civil society, industry, and the public at large will respond. One example of this is we have a validation structure for conventional toxicological tests that is in place that is based on completely different assumptions about what we're trying to do in testing, which may stand in the way of the use of these kinds of tools, right? So again, here is something that will allow us to deal with a complex system, but again faces its own obstacles because it itself is embedded in a socio-technical complex system. Complexity challenge number two uh, has to do with this issue of um, how do we deal with all the information that we have to manage, not just the toxicological? So this, you know, this is a little decision tree about thinking about the different uh, decision criteria. But then when you get into the weeds in terms of trying to operationalize what these criteria mean, suddenly that decision tree gets even more complicated. And this is a simplified version of what's being used in California right now, in which companies are being asked to look at 89 different uh, human health and ecological endpoints in addition to thinking about technical feasibility and uh, uh, economic feasibility. So how do we manage this kind of complexity? Are there tools that we can use for that? And again, the answer to that may be the deployment of another tool that's been developed in the face of dealing with complex decision making, multi-criteria decision analysis, right? There's different approaches to multi-criteria decision analysis. What I've put up here uh, are really just kind of some of the output that we've had in uh, some of the studies that we've done in trying to integrate decision analysis into alternatives analysis. It has its own obstacles to face, again, similarly to what I talked about with respect to predictive toxicology, right? There is a complex regulatory system that has not used multi-criteria decision analysis in the past as well as suspicion on the part of civil society and even industry about what the outcome of objective, transparent decision making might say in terms of how they interact with each other in the social and political and regulatory spheres. Okay, one last thing to say. Um, I, I'm looking at the zero minute sign. Joshua is holding it up. Um, I'm going to ignore it. Uh, just to get my last few slides in, but I just wanted you to put it down so that you can get your arms, your arms don't get tired. I'm going to be very quick, but I just want to finish off with just uh, this last piece of it, and then I will be out of your way. Uh, that second piece, let's suppose we've identified the alt safer viable alternative. How do we get it out into the marketplace? How do we use legal and uh, private governance mechanisms to drive it out? There's a bunch of different ways in which we can do that. That's not news to people. Right? Affirmative incentives like tax policy, technology policy. We can uh, use mandatory adoption. We might use information disclosure and hope that drives the market. We have a panoply of policy approaches, right? And the question is, how do we choose among them? Our current systems for looking at uh, what will happen when we uh, deploy a new policy are woefully inadequate for dealing with what is clearly a complex system, right? How will, we, we think about these regulatory policies as if they're focusing on individual actors, an individual company or manufacturer, 
But what they're really trying to do is affect a broad, complex, socio-technical, political, legal system. Right? And they're going to have emergent properties, and they're going to have unexpected outcomes. So the question is, how do we deal with that, particularly when we're talking about emerging technologies that themselves we are very worried about? Current policy approaches, economic modeling, right? uh, regulatory impact analysis, are thin in the sense that they are not designed to deal with complex systems. They look at very uh, a, a small set of criteria, and they don't really think about the interactive impact that different agents in these uh, linked embedded systems uh, will exhibit. Right? So what is the answer? I want to talk about one, which is the deployment of modeling that's designed for complex systems in the policy framework. And agent-based modeling is one example of that. So agent-based modeling simulates the activity of individual agents within a complex system, right? So, and it generates kind of a series of potential outcomes, and we can look at that over time. The really helpful part about it is these agents are autonomous and heterogeneous, and they can be embedded with decision rules, right, that will drive their activity. Right? We can control what kind of information is available to them, and we can build into the model legal, social, and organizational constraints. So what happens is when we run these models, we can look at how the individual agents act, and we can observe what properties emerge over time. So I'll give you one example. It hasn't been widely used, although there's a great deal of talk about how to use agent-based modeling for making what we call basically policy simulation. Right? But one example, which I'll just put up and then I will finish up, uh, this is an example of a, a conceptual uh, system model that was used in agent-based modeling of the phase-out of incandescent lights in uh, Europe. Right? So the individual agents are the consumers. Based on surveying and what we know about the diffusion of new technologies, we identify different decision rules, we look at the communication that is available, so on and so forth, and then you can run these models and simulate it. But there's a limit, right? It's just a model, but what is really unusual about these models is that they don't actually predict, right? I mean, by definition, they can't, right? Agent-based modeling is designed for complex systems in which emergent properties make outcomes unpredictable. So of what use are they? They don't predict, but they actually allow the policy makers to consider the possibilities. They can reveal to the policy makers emergent outcomes that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise seen using these other policy approaches or qualitative approaches or brainstorming or professional judgment. They alert them to the emergent properties and the possible outcomes. And they can be most useful when they're combined with robust scenario analysis in which we run many, many thousands, tens of thousands of scenarios searching for patterns and trying to identify policy strategies that are the most robust. That is, the ones that get us to the outcome that we find most desirable across a range of scenarios that we know are possible. So we're not predicting, but in a sense, essentially we're looking for that dominant strategy, the best strategy, considering the information and possibilities that we do know. And so the beat goes on. So what I've hoped in the time, and the extended time that I'm sorry, Josh, that I took to get to the end, in the time is to talk a little bit about and explain a little bit about how complexity can both uh, be an obstacle, but also complexity can be a tool for overcoming those obstacles. And um, I'm happy to take questions when we get to the Q&A. Thank you very much. So I'm going to advocate that a solutions-oriented approach to some of the challenges that we have with complex systems is to actually make them more complicated. And this might sound kind of asinine and ridiculous, uh, but as I hope to demonstrate, actually making a complex system more complicated simplifies it. Um, and so if there are any of you who are experts in you know, systems dynamics and things like that, I ask you to kind of take it easy on me. I'm adopting some of your very sophisticated principles as inspiration or sort of as metaphors for the approach that I'm taking. I don't mean to imply uh, that I'm being particularly rigorous with respect to, to that discipline. 
Um, just a quick word about uh, the Initiative on Governance of Emerging Technological Systems, which I direct over at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. This is a university-wide initiative that we've developed uh, to uh, stimulate research and facilitate dialogue um, around uh, governance issues across different emerging technological sy uh, systems of emerging technologies as well as across different governance systems. And the systems focus is really what's serving as the grounding of, with, of, of some of my thoughts on complexity that I'm going to um, share with you today. And I'll get started with you know, what my central propositions are for your consideration, um, which I'll hopefully clarify over the next 15 minutes. And that is that um, emerging technologies are attempting to simplify complex scientific and technological systems by making them more complicated, and that it may be useful to attempt to do the same with complex governance uh, systems. Um, and you know, we already heard a bit from Wendell on what the difference is between complexity and uh, something being complicated. Um, but we often use this term complex when we talk about emerging technologies, especially when we're talking about some of the more active applications of these technologies, and particularly in the context of convergence, where we're looking at truly sophisticated, multifunctional technological systems. Uh, and we also tend to use the term complex when we're talking about risks or problems posed by these emerging technologies, uh, and when we talk about emerging technologies governance. Um, and so, you know, what makes a system or a problem complex? Um, and complexity really describes systems for which the functions or the outcomes can't be assigned to any individual part or component. Each function or outcome is the result of multiple interactions among multiple different components in a way that makes it that we can't really individually identify what those components do. Um, and furthermore, because each input can contribute to multiple functions and each function can be produced by multiple inputs, we can't very effectively predict the range of outcomes with any great degree of certainty. And then, so then what's a complicated system or problem? That's one where the, we can kind of disintegrate it down to its individual components or parts, and where each of these components or parts performs some kind of identifiable function or a discrete set of functions that are necessary for the overall performance of that system. Um, so that is when we have a complicated system, we can break down, we can isolate and manipulate each input um, to produce a fairly specific or predictable or near certain output. Um, and you know, so I think a good illustration uh, of, of the difference is the difference between tic-tac-toe and go, which is similar to, to the game example that Wendell also used, which means I must be right. Um, we can think of tic-tac-toe as being a complicated game, right? We have a small board and, you know, after the initial move is made, there are sufficient number of illegal moves that it becomes pretty easy to figure out what your next step should be. And that's why most of us, you know, by the time we were eight, figured out that if we went first, we could control the game and win. Um, but a complex game is something like this Chinese game of go where, you know, we have very simple rules, but a massive amount of variation in individual games. I mean, they say that, you know, um, the number of possible games exceeds the number of atoms in the observable universe. So, you know, what happens in one portion of the board, hundreds of turns later, can be affected by something happening in a completely different um, section. And it's precisely because of this large variance in the possible interactions and outcomes, as well as the lack of correlations between the individual uh, constituent elements and those interactions and outcomes, it really makes it pointless to try to distinguish between the individual constituent parts of a complex system. We're much better off distinguishing the interactions or the correlations between interactions and outcomes rather than trying to define the individual parts themselves. And so as a result, when we want to understand or describe uh, complex systems, 
be it in biology or economics or computer science or in governance studies, um, essentially what we do is we do simulations and we come up with models. But of course, you know, the more simulations we run and the more um, variations and interactions we produce that are related to outcomes, the less predictive our models become. I mean, this is, you know, the paradox of complexity that we often see described, that um, the more realistic our model for a complex system becomes, the more difficult it is to understand uh, what real world process is actually attempting to describe. So really the best we can do is try to make some uncertain pattern um, predictions, and there are a lot of really smart people writing, you know, on much, much more nuanced analysis. Um, so what I'm covering here really is the very, very tip of the iceberg. And of course, a significant portion of physics and chemistry and biology is understood as being complex systems, and this is pretty logical, especially in the case of biology. Um, so for example, the, the illustration on the bottom I know is kind of hard to see. This is a chart of the complex system of molecules and pathways that are responsible for gene expression, or for all the different various aspects of uh, uh, metabolism. So things like you know, gene expression and polymorphism of DNA and all the different things that have um, an effect. And then the top one is, is from a statistical physics lab looking at some issue that I can't even understand what it was. Um, um, so there's a lot of statistical modeling that goes on, but wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of all of this complexity and its attendant uncertainty and instead have these be complicated systems where we can identify and control the different parts and predict what the outcomes are, because then instead of having to rely on really complicated statistical versions of essentially divining rods, um, we can work like engineers and come up with solutions for which we are fully cognizant of the design, where we can forecast the behavior under specific operating conditions um, with all respect to all the different intended functions. And I lifted that language actually specifically from ABET's definition of engineering. And I think perhaps this is the goal of many areas of emerging technologies. Um, so principles of nano let us uh, see and understand and manipulate matter at the molecular and submolecular scales. And this in turn helps us in, for example, biology to see and understand and manipulate neural and genetic and protein and uh, cellular and metabolic and whatever other pathways there are that comprise biological functions. And so, you know, how does this get us away from complexity? I mean, really the only way to change a complex system into a complicated one is to close that system, right? To try to limit the number of interactions that can take place among the system's different parts um, such that we also constrain the range of outputs that that system can produce or the functions that it can perform. And, you know, to what extent are we um, actually doing this? I mean, right now, not really to any great extent. I mean, so for example, we can manipulate an organism's genome uh, by inserting new DNA from a foreign source to say knock out a gene or you know, delete a point mutation or the like. And we call this genetic engineering because to some extent it is an attempt to engineer a solution, but all the parts still have to interact uh, within a system to carry out the intended function and this to a great degree you know, still uh, depends on unpredictable interaction. So we might be doing some limited redesign of function, um, but we're only able to do so to the extent allowed by the architecture of the DNA. I think synthetic biology perhaps gets us a lot closer, right? I mean, that's really the philosophy behind things like biobricks, to have standardized biological parts with defined structures and functions that we can combine to construct systems that have functions that are wholly human defined and controllable by the engineer. And I think biobricks are a really great example of what I mean when I say that emerging technologies are pushing us from complex to complicated. Um, I don't know what happened with that image. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, what, if anything, does this have to do with the governance of emerging technologies? Well, our governance systems are also massively complex, um, and uh, the more broadly and inclusively we frame government governance, the more complex and unwieldy and unpredictable the system is. Um, and, you know, I think recognition of this is the basis for all of the recommendations that we have flexible and reflexive and adaptive and iterative approaches to governance that presume our limited ability to forecast accurately um, and that are designed to deal with uncertain outcomes as they happen. But at the same time, and we know we're setting ourselves up for failure, right? I mean, if we use a complex system to try to give order to another complex system, the natural state of things is going to be a lot of incidents of failures. And as we try to model and model to try to identify as many possible interactions and outcomes as we can for the governance systems, we're much less able to identify which inputs are contributing to these outcomes and how. So it can be really difficult to identify particular areas of concern um, or to identify where our priorities should be. So I think there's perhaps a lesson here that we can take from the emerging te technologies that we're trying to govern. Um, and I think that you know, it's time for some of us in, in the academic context to actually you know, move or diversify away from all of these attempts to try to characterize the complexities of governance exclusively and instead try to come up with some methodologies that allow us to limit the number of interactions or outcomes that we're looking at such that we can differentiate and understand some of these system inputs um, in particular environments, so say a particular governance subsystem or a particular application area or a particular um, regulatory regime. Am I out of time? Um, so I have very little to, to cover. So I mean, I think there are, uh, there's a lot of space for, for innovation in terms of methodologies for doing this, but I think there are some approaches that have been used that are, are worth mentioning. One was a project that we did at University of Minnesota looking at oversight of nano bio. Um, and uh, it was a mixed methods approach, but I mean, essentially the way it began was with doing an evaluation of five historical oversight models that are relevant to this nanobio interface. So drugs and devices, gene therapy, GEOs, chemicals in the workplace. Um, and essentially uh, uh, through some consultation with experts, uh, what we did as part of this project was identify a concrete sort of set of criteria um, that define the development, the different attributes, and the outcomes of each of these governance systems. And then in the context of these application areas, the experts evaluated what was strong, what was weak. Um, and then based on sort of this limited closed interpretation of the system, we could actually draw some common correlations among these criteria um, in a way that could inform uh, lessons for governing nanobiotechnology. I think another nice example is the work that Jennifer Kuzma has done in synthetic biology on developing a typology. Um, uh, essentially what they've done is you know, they've developed categories of governance issues as well as typologies of synthetic biology applications in an attempt to um, focus some of the policy discussions away from just general discussion across systems to areas where we can identify concrete outcomes, problems, and areas of prioritization. So I'll stop there. Thank you. But every one of them also has a lot of very serious potential risks and problems and uh, things we have to deal with uh, to make these, uh, get these benefits from these technologies. And traditionally when we have these kind of problems and risks, we rely on government to try and uh, solve this through traditional regulation. Uh, but when we talk about almost all the technologies on that list, uh, I see two fundamental problems for regulatory agencies in our traditional way of regulating. One is what we call the pacing problem. Uh, Brad Ellenby and I have, and some others here have been uh, running this project called the Pacing Project for the last few years about how the timing is so hard for agencies to keep up. And the other one I call just jurisdictional misalignment. 
And so the pacing problem is just we have all these technologies going at exponential rate, Moore's Law and so on, for all these different technologies, all uh, going forward at a tremendous rate. You know, the amount of time it takes to get 50 million users of a technology has gone down, down dramatically over the last few uh, decades. They're just technologies are coming so quickly to us now. And while technology is going faster than ever, I think law is going slower than ever. So our regulatory agency, the term often used is ossification. Many of our regulations get frozen in place. Uh, an agency to do a regulation now has to go through about 20 different separate analysis required by Congress and so on. Each one of them maybe makes sense, but when you put them all together, it's just a huge burden to regulate. And uh, an agency like OSHA, which uh, Adam Finkel is head of their health standards, he was here yesterday, they do like one standard every 10 years now. Even though there's many they should be doing, they do one every 10 years. It's just so burdensome to do. NHTSA basically got out of uh, regulating altogether now. It's just too hard to do with too many legal obstacles and then it just gets overturned by a court. Our legislatures and Congress have slowed down. Uh, the word uh, gridlock is often the word you hear with them. Uh, it, it, the famous book by John Kingdom, you maybe just have these brief windows of opportunity and then there's just no chance with so many issues and so much partisanship to ever get anything done in Congress. Our courts, the word you often hear with them is glacial. Uh, there's a fascinating discussion by the D.C. Circuit when they had the Microsoft antitrust appeal where they start the case by saying, hey, we're trying to, we're supposed to be looking at whether this uh, Windows 98 is, you know, monopolizing the market and we're already up to Windows 2003, like three generations later, like what's the point? This is just, uh, we just can't as an institution keep up with this technology. It's sort of pointless to even have to decide these cases because they're moving so quickly. Um, just one example is the Clean Air Act, uh, you know, a very important environmental statute. The first amendment took two years, and then three years, and then seven years, and then 13 years. And right now we're running 24 years and counting, and it's not because there's no issues. There's a huge number of issues. The statute's completely obsolete. It doesn't even mention really global warming. One of the major issues EPA has to deal with in air pollution. It has all these deadlines for states that have now past what's in the statute. And there's actually lawsuits figuring out what do you do when Congress has blown it and put these deadlines in that are now past it? How is EPA supposed to figure out what to do? It's just a completely obsolete statute and yet Congress can't and isn't even trying to update it. Um, so we have this growing gap then between these technologies moving ever faster and our regulatory world and our legal world moving ever slower. As Dave Rajeski from the Wilson Center said, we've moved into a world dominated by rapid improvements in products, processes, and organizations all moving at rates that exceed the ability of our traditional government institutions to adapt or shape outcomes. If you think that any existing regulatory framework can keep pace with this rate of change, think again. And when, when we have this, uh, this growing gap, we have obsolete regulations and statutes out there that are sitting out there. For example, the Clean Water Act, another environmental statute. You know, when, when that was written in 1972, the big problem was point sources. And, and the statute's done remarkably well in controlling that. But most water pollution now is non-point. Arizona, it's 90%. And it doesn't really regulate that. And we've known this for 20, 30 years. And yet we haven't been able to update that statute. The Delaney Clause was finally updated, even though for 30 years we knew it was scientifically obsolete that you have to get rid of all carcinogens in food when we now know any chemical can cause cancer in a certain type of study. Uh, completely scientifically obsolete. It wasn't until the D.C. Circuit, I mean, sorry, the Ninth Circuit finally said to EPA, you have to ban all food when EPA said, that's ridiculous, and they said, yeah, go tell Congress that. So Congress finally, after the Ninth Circuit basically told EPA you have to ban all food, finally went forward and, and amended that statute. It took that kind of drastic action. We have all kinds of issues that have been around for years that have never been regulated. You know, online privacy, genetic testing, in vitro fertilization. We've never got around to regulating those problems. So we have a huge problem of keeping up to date for regulatory agencies. And the other thing is uh, what I call jurisdictional misalignment. When I, um, I used to be a regulatory lawyer for a decade when I got out of law school. In my first case, I was so excited to get this case and work on as first of a summer associate and then as a law student and then as a first year associate. Had to do with uh, a case where the DC Circuit told EPA they had to define what's, uh, what's acceptable risk in the world in which we live. Fascinating issue, incredibly complex, incredibly complicated. I was really jazzed to be working on this. And it was, but it was one agency working on one chemical, uh, on one industry. In fact, there's only something like 10 plants that even emitted this stuff. And they only looked at the stack emissions and they were looking at one endpoint, cancer. It was, in retrospect, so simple in some ways compared to something like, say, nanotech now, 
where you have do, you know, maybe a dozen federal agencies with some role in this. You have state regulators and municipalities. You have uh, uh, the International Standards Organization. You have the, what the EU does makes a huge difference for our industry and our regulation. Uh, you have all kinds of industry programs. You have uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of different products that you have to regulate. You have every industry in the country. There's no such thing as a nanotech trade association because it's every industry. You're looking at the complete product life cycle, not just emissions or something like that. And you're looking at a huge range of potential outcomes, uh, the 90 whatever points that Tim talked about environmental and health, but beyond that, privacy and all kinds of social and ethical implications and economic displacement and all kinds of problems. So it's just so much more complicated than anything we had to do in the past. And this complication isn't just complication, it's complexity. And so uh, one of the traits of complexity is heterogeneity. You certainly see that with the diversity of applications and jurisdictions and risks and benefits. You see emergent properties that when you look at, say, a chemical, you can often predict its cost ecology by its structure activity relationship. You can't do that with nanoparticles. There's some other thing emerging there that you can't predict. Uh, Nonlinearity, just look at how technologies like 3D printers and drones and autonomous vehicles have been sort of talked about for a while and all of a sudden, boom, they're here. Uh, Dorothy Glancy gave a talk on autonomous vehicles the other day and you know, the next day there's another story in the news of something new happening, you know, just changing quicker and you can even keep your slides up to date on. Uh, path dependency, you look at an agency like EPA trying to deal with synthetic biology and they're stuck with this statute written in 1976 that was never anticipating this, but you're stuck down that path. You get all kinds of surprises. I was at a, a fascinating conference here a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, uh, mobile health and, and Mayo was uh, showing this uh, little app they got that you just sort of click on the top of your cell phone and it runs EKGs on your body regularly throughout the day just by having your cell phone attached to you. And they're doing a trial with 300 of their heart patients and they're uh, monitoring them because these are people with very high mortality from a heart disease. And uh, so they're talking about it and then I was sitting at lunch with one of the male doctors He said, so I wanted to ask you this legal question. We got a call a couple weeks ago uh, from a, what, the wife of one of our patients and he was out of town on a business trip and uh, she was monitoring his heart on the computer and said at two in the morning his heart started going like crazy. So he called the emergency number and they said, well, that's not a heart condition actually, just some vigorous activities engaged in. And uh, the male doctor said, you know, am, am I supposed to really tell her what's really going on there because I think I know what's going on and do I have a legal duty to do this? And he said, you know, how did we get into this? We, we, we didn't anticipate this kind of thing and that's what you're going to see with these technologies. All these unexpected little things come up all the time. And then unpredictable future states. Bill Gates, Gates gave a great speech once when he talked about anyone who's trying to predict the internet more than five years out doesn't know what they're talking about. None of us know. We can ne never predict that far out in advance. So when you have this complex systems, the only way to really deal with it is as a whole. You can go in and try and fiddle with different parts, but it's going to affect other parts. And unless you look at the whole, you're going to miss important things when you have a complex adaptive system. And our legal system necessarily misses things. And so one good example is all the ethical, social implications of a lot of these technologies. This is what a large part of the public, when they have concerns about technology, it's motivated by that. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of those concerns, but it's no question that a lot of people have those kind of concerns. And so how are we going to deal with them in our regulatory system? And the answer is we don't. We exclude them. And so a good example is animal cloning. Again, I have no problems with this, but a lot of people in our public do, and FDA did a, re uh, a rulemaking where they're basically looking at the safety of, of meat and milk from cloned animals, and they asked for public comments, and they got tens of thousands of comments, almost all negative, and almost all focusing on the ethical and social implications of this technology and how people were objected to it, and FDA just dismissed those tens of thousands of comments in one sentence that the agency has not been charged with addressing moral, religious, and ethical issues, and so we cannot consider those arguments. So you have tens of thousands of U.S. citizens taking the initiative to contact our government about something they're cared about, and the government says, sorry, we can't look at that. And legally, that, the FDA position was right. They're not allowed to look at it. And there's reasons for that. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't want our regulatory agencies looking at ethics of things um, because unlike say whether something causes cancer in someone where we all agree on, a lot of these things are much more subjective and, and differences. We saw in the film Fix the other night how different people are looking at enhancement from very different perspectives and views. It's not clear what's good and what's bad. It's, it's very subjective. Uh, we, we don't have the institutional capability of ethicists and philosophers or theologians in our government agencies and most people probably wouldn't want them there. There's probably First Amendment issues if you try to do that. So there's reasons it's hard to do that but it also leaves us in a very unsafe satisfactory position where we're trying to regulate these technologies with agencies and they're not allowed to consider important parts of the problem.
So what do we do about this? This is the last talk of this conference, so I'm going to tell you all the answers right now. Actually, no, but there's, there's four things I think are potentially promising. One is, and none of them are by any means perfect, is the idea of sort of soft law governance mechanisms. Um, these have a number of advantages of being able to say soft law may, basically means you have this substantive ex expectations, but they're not enforceable. So they can be adopted through a number of different mechanisms, voluntary programs, partnership programs, standard setting organizations, codes of conduct, and we've seen just a huge proliferation of this. I think if you go to the EPA website, they have over 100 programs that they're involved with as an agency. Many of them don't even involve agencies, so there's all kinds of different ways these can be structured. And these have a number of advantages. They can be uh, cooperative, uh, they can be reflexive, they can be up updated much more quickly, they can adapt, you don't have to go through notice and comment rulemaking. You can address any issue you want, including the ethical dimensions. You can try a lot of different things. And then these can gradually be sort of hardened into more traditional government regulations. This is a model uh, I and a couple of colleagues did of sort of starting with the voluntary gradually moving at sort of more enforced voluntary and then finally traditional regulation. And I think that model actually works. I'm on a National Academy of Science uh, committee right now looking at greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, and fuel economy from heavy duty and medium duty trucks. And one of the EPA's voluntary programs is called SmartWay where, um, you know, EPA for the first time and NHTSA were required to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and fuel economy from large trucks. And they basically, in the first round of regulations, focused only on the engine. They didn't have a lot of time. That's where the main source is. But it turns out the trailer has all kinds of implications for fuel economy and greenhouse gas emissions. So because they didn't get that in the regulation, they created a, a voluntary program called SmartWay to try to deal with that. And they experimented with a lot of different technologies and approaches and figured out some things worked and some didn't. And when they started to get that success, California adopted it in its regulations. And now the federal government in the second round, which is coming out, is going to propose it almost certainly, I haven't seen it yet, but almost certainly, we just had a National Academy of Science report on this a month ago, so, you know, saying this should be the main thing they do, is going to ha basically incorporate that in regulation. So it's going from a voluntary program, trying it out, fixing the problems, moving it gradually into state regulation, and then finding the federal regulation. So it's a model that I think works. There's problems with these, accountability, credibility, participation, transparency, and so on. A second solution, I think, is international coordination. These technologies are global by, uh, in several different ways. They, they, they affect people globally. They, they can't be controlled without global. So the idea of looking at this more internationally is, again, I think something to look at the whole you have to do. Again, our, I know our federal agencies are looking at this a lot. Uh, this is incredibly challenging to regulate internationally. You'll never have you know, hard and fast international regulations. Uh, but you can deal with a lot of problems if you can try to try to make international regulation more consistent. Um, and there's a lot of ways of doing this. In, a, in our little group, we're going to get together at lunch today looking at this issue of international. We're going to solve all that problem, and, and this will be a, a cured solution. But I, I do think this is an area where a lot of uh, opportunity is there. The OECD just is this fascinating series of four reports and basically said there's a lot of potential here, but there's a lot more scholarly and academic work has to go into looking at these. So there's a great opportunity for us to work on. Third solution is adaptive management. Um, a, a great law review article just came out looking at this of how our whole administrative law is built on this idea of you go through this big, long, elaborate process and have the public uh, involved in it, and then you make a decision and it just sits there for 30 years. And that just doesn't work for these technologies changing all the time. We have to have a new way of, of how we structure administrative law to allow regulatory agencies to be constantly updating this and not being punished for doing that, which you do now. A soft law, uh, things like mandatory periodic reviews, we had a great talk yesterday on sunset requirements. These are all ways to make regulation more adaptive, to be able to change over time. And then finally, uh, an idea that Wendell Wallace and I have had together, and we've uh, proposed this last year, is the idea you sort of need an institutional issue manager, not a regulator, no, no one with any legal teeth, but someone to bring together all the interested stakeholders and parties, regulators and uh, uh, industry and NGOs and so on, to try and uh, coordinate the issue and sort of be a, an issue coordinator, orchestra conductor, I think is the, the term Wendell came up with. And so we've uh, created this proposal for a governance coordination committee, maybe for each technology. Uh, and uh, would do all these different things to try and help to do the big picture, which I think is, again, you need to do with a complex technology. It's not something a regulatory agency can do because of its jur jurisdictional limits, but I think that's the kind of uh, thing that could help uh, maybe move the ball along. So four possibilities to help, I think, help us with this. None of them perfect. All of them, there's criticisms of, but all can move the, the, um, the, the 
the ball forward. And so I'll just conclude with this cartoon, uh, these two kids laying on the ground saying, this one looks like a falling engine. I think that's where we are with emerging technologies. Uh, relying, sort of try to rely solely on traditional regulation is not going to be sufficient. We need traditional regulation, but we need a lot more. And uh, hopefully these are four ideas that can help move the ball forward. Thank you. Just a, a, a few questions. So um, starting, yes, in the back, uh, Ken. Uh, very, very interesting panel. And I'm going to try to focus just a little bit to all the panels. We were talking about adaptive regulation and adaptive law. At the same time, there's an issue of adapting law. And if you look at Joe's work at Parker, um, old statutes, uh, new problems, old wine, sort of old bottles in the wine. To what extent do you believe that there is sufficient capacity for adapting and modifying old law to address the problems that we've been discussing? Obviously, it's taking place in areas like carbon uh, and the regulation of carbon. How much stretch is there? There's a lot of stretch out there in the many statutes. So um, quickly, uh, for those who aren't able to hear it, uh, what capacity is there for, for modifying old laws or old process institutions for, for dealing with um, new, new technologies and new things? So I have a, a couple of thoughts on that. One is I think it's important to identify the difference between the law on the books and the law in action. So my view is when we read those statutes, those statutes for the most part have a fair amount of discretion built into them. They've become institutionalized for a variety of reasons, some from court decisions, but even those court decisions have been kind of uh, constructed to, to a particular narrative about what the law actually is. So I'll use Tosca as an example. My view of Tosca is that it's actually, despite some of the obvious flaws, it actually gives the EPA a fair amount of discretion for dealing with these things, and it, but has for a variety of reasons been restricted. One, so the short answer is I think there's plenty of discretion. I think the bigger problem is not the structure of the laws, but actually uh, the lack of resources accorded to particular agencies. So could we deal with some of the nanotechnology or synthetic biology issues in the various agencies in a more, in a, in a, in a quicker, more comprehensive way? I think the answer is yes, but essentially we're starving the agencies of resources. So I think that's more of a problem than the structure of most of these statutes. Uh, just Jim, I, mean, I, I agree with Tim. I think you know we should move things as as our world gets more and more complicated, more and more downstream. So from Congress to agencies and even to non-governmental actors, a lot. And uh, and so yes, agencies need more resources. But Congress shouldn't pass a new statute for each new technology. That's just not feasible. It's not going to happen. So if that's the case, you're going to have to adapt, as you say, existing statutes to new technologies. And that means you have to write those statutes much more broadly and generally, with some general principles that the agency can then take and adapt to different, different regulate technologies. I do a lot of talks to judges, and I tell them the same thing. When they write an opinion, there's so many technologies coming down the pipes now. When you write an opinion about privacy of this technology, go through a mental exercise and think of five other technologies that'll be here in the next few years, and how your opinion is going to relate to them, because it's going to apply to that as well. And often, you need to write the opinion then more broadly and more carefully than looking at the specifics of that particular technology and letting it run the decision. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not going to get it in the right order, but um, uh, here in the front and then um, around that way. So uh, I just wanted to, to mention, because I haven't heard sure mention that uh, Eleanor Oxford was a Nobel Prize winner, who talked about new institutional economics, and she talked about how new forms of governance would arise, public and private parties together, and they arise spontaneously. And it seems to me that her work is a perfect marriage for what we're talking about. Well, we're, we're proud that we sort of adopted her late in her career. Before she passed away, she 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 moved at least part part time of the year to ASU, and we have a whole program started in, uh, that she started there. And, and it's exactly it's adaptive management essentially at a decentralized level, and it, you know it's made tremendous success in the areas where it's been applied. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the idea of governance and uh, its role. 
necessarily so with regard to complex systems. Uh, it may be more difficult to assign responsibility, but uh, one of the roles of government in these technologies is uh, assigning responsibility. So um, for those who didn't hear, uh, assigning responsibility um, in complex systems. Any comments? Well, let me, let me address that first. I mean, I don't think they have to dilute responsibilities, but I think there will be movement toward their dilution of responsibilities unless governance moves in in a way, or unless engineering moves in a way of being more selective about engineering systems in ways where we can attribute responsibilities for the failure of those systems. If we don't do that, then we will be forced to dilute responsibilities as we move to more and more autonomy, simply because of the unpredictability of how those systems are going to function in new contexts. Let me just add to that. I think there's some confusion. The, the notion of self-organization and autonomy is not uh, mutually exclusive with the concept of assigning responsibility. There are, I think, plenty of examples of systems that have organized themselves that have autonomous agents within them, but one of the outputs of the system was to assign responsibilities without necessarily having a centralized decision maker that does it. Right? If we think about markets, markets in a sense work that way. Uh, a lot of social networks work that way. When you think, so that's one form of governance. When I think about governance where an agency or a institution is in uh, attempting now to step in and itself assign responsibility. It's acting as part of a system when it does that and when it makes that judgment, you know, if we're trying to do good governance, I think we really need to think about what the kind of the outlying consequences of the assignment that we've made and to think about the alternative structures we could have developed and what those outputs might be. Okay, good. Um, uh, Mark? I'm um, not sure if I'm going to be able to do a good job of summarizing that, but if you could. <laughs> I, I didn't quite catch yeah. the, the, the form of analysis you were suggesting. Well, okay. For example, this context of alternative assessment, it's not only that you have to deal with more uh, bits and pieces of technology or products, you also, as you showed, you have more contexts that you have to somehow combine. Social, environmental, health. And that's a, an increasing complexity in the uh, values, in choosing, as opposed to simply having more the units of technical or materialistic risk that you are living. So, I mean, mm -hmm. not say dualism trumps knowledge, but I think sometimes it's helpful to, to look at complexity, the world of jobs and the values versus the world of matter. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in fact, that's something that keeps me up at night uh, because the way I think about alternatives analysis is that it's actually what you're attempting to do is meld those together. You're attempting to take kind of normative values, preferences, and build them into a system that uh, guides the trade-offs that you're making and doing it in an explicit way so that people are aware of it, right? So one of the ways that that reflects itself when I talk about the complexity of building an alternatives analysis framework or method that can then be used in a governance system is how do you capture from this uh, social system you're doing, how do you capture what those preferences are and reflect them in the methodology, which is, um, uh, I will say it is both complex and complicated, but I think you're right. It's something that ha we have to figure out a way to do it. The interesting thing is, uh, in California, when we've been trying to uh, uh, get the agency to make, to build in the notion of how much weight do we put on these various criteria that we're making a decision to build that into the regulatory system and make it part of the explicit methodology? 
there was a lot of pushback from the agency from that, one, because they didn't want to be making those kinds of calls, and two, because they felt what that might do is actually limit their discretion, right, by having to actually identify what, their pre what they think the societal preferences are. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, if that's what you are after, but I think you're absolutely right that the, when we're building these complex methodologies that are attempting to capture what will go on in that, the external environment, that it, for them to really be legitimate and transparent and ob even objective, we need to be explicit about what those normative values are and how we're expressing them. Yeah, I think you, I mean, as the system is more complex and so those units and metrics and things that you're talking about become more uncertain and less reliable, then it certainly becomes those normative complexities that matter more in terms of how we make a decision, right? So, I mean, that has to be a central consideration. I also agree that it's, I think the whole upstream regulatory framework is largely about the instantiation of values from the get-go. And the instantiation of values from the bottom up, whether that's in the form of, of outcomes coming from the legislature or whether that's in, form, in the form of engineers being asked to give attention to certain values or at least broadly shared values as part of the design specifications for the systems they're developing, that will help considerably in terms of which alternative platforms will be looked at for solving different problems. So in many of the problems we're attending to, there are, there are, there are many solutions to the, to the problem, but we may be favoring one over the other for actually poor reasons. So I think that favoring autonomy over certain other solutions is poor if what you really want to do is have robust responsibility, culpability, and liability in your system. If you don't care about that, then for, for example, autonomous systems that you can't always predict their actions are fine. So I think that's, I think this whole values equation becomes central when we're talking about what can be done upstream versus downstream regulation after the fact. Um, I think we're essentially out of time, but I'd like to squeeze in two more questions. Um, so maybe if you can make them short, um, John McGinnis and then uh, David Gustin, if you could both say, have your questions and then uh, have the panelists respond to them. <laughs> All right, thank you. So um, I guess one question relates to the, uh, the pacing glass being half full um, by uh, preventing government um, bad action, I suppose. And, and then another question um, asking about um, <clears throat> not just not so much prediction, but anticipation. 
and uh, things that we can can do. Um, so, so maybe I could try and address the first one. So I. I I think you know the, the pacing problem to me is two-dimensional. There's there's not regulations where we should have them, and there's old regulations on the books that are now obsolete. And both of those are, I think, s symptoms of the same problem of it, it's impossible for our very creaky legal institutions to move in, in accordance with the changing world. And sometimes, as examples you say, sort of the technology sort of knocks out the regulation. It just sort of makes it obsolete. But a lot of times they hang out there and they, they continue to be a major problem, like the Delaney Clause, like you know FDA and EPA spending 30 years trying to get foods, you know, different things approved around this completely obsolete statute. It was just a huge impediment. It creates all kinds of uncertainty for all kinds of parties and stakeholders involved. So to me, having obsolete statutes and regulations is part of the pacing problem. And uh, sometimes it'll be the technology that knocks them out, but also I think sometimes we need to get those off the books through legal mechanisms. Well, I, I just um, I wanted to say I really agree with David's point about the anticipation and the role that that can play. And actually, I think feeds back into what I talked about in terms of the agent-based modeling, the robust scenario analysis, because one of the things that can be done with the robust scenario analysis is, you know, one of the things you think about are what scenarios should matter, which ones should you be focusing on, and uh, part of that process can include at the front end the kinds of thing I think David is talking about and finding out, having those discussions, and that allows you to use those methods to narrow the scenarios and then give feedback to those folks in terms of what is important to them, what the outcomes of that could be. And the same can be said for alternatives analysis in response to that prior question in that the alternatives analysis and the multi-criteria decision analysis can be used in a sense to also be constructive or uh, help people actually come to terms with what their values are because they're forced in that process to think about what those are, see what the outcomes are, and then have conversations about what the actual preference is uh, would be under the scenarios that they're presented with. So I, I think it's really just not a, uh, these are not just uh, kind of analytical methods, but they're also tools for, for uh, perhaps deeper participation uh, in the process. Thank you. All right. Well, um, let me, sorry. So let me just finish with one thing. I mean, uh, I also agree with uh, how David was uh, building out that point, and I think that's perhaps one of the greatest overriding issues we have as we're, we've been discussing here over the last two days. I, I know the scenario I outlined was a little bit dark, but I actually think that that's, that dark scenario has some justification if we don't find a way of having this more upstream rigorous analysis of what we're about in the development of these emerging technologies. And as this example with genetically modified foods goes, um, particularly with, um, uh, with the animals and the FDA's decision, we are not having that robust conversation in this society. And the public is, I think, anxious about that and perhaps moving more toward throwing their hands up in the air and believing in inevitabilities as opposed to the possibility of some active direction, if not absolute control, of the development of the emerging technologies. All right, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much to our, our, our panelists, and you'd like to join me in uh, congratulating you. Uh, I don't want to keep you from lunch any longer, but just a couple of, of quick uh, announcements. First of all, for the uh, affinity groups, um, go ahead and check on the board to see uh, the, the, where you'll be meeting, and, and uh, we'll be able to grab a box lunch and, and, and go meet and have those discussions. I also would like to uh, thank all those who have helped make this uh, conference possible. Um, uh, Corey and, and Cindy, who have been uh, handling our, our, all of our technical aspects, and, and Deb Ralph, and, um, Lauren and Alex, who have been helping uh, at, at the table, and especially, most of all, um, uh, Gary Marchant, who, who basically has pulled all of this uh, together while I've been AWOL, uh, taking leave for, <laughs> um, for work right before this all happened. So I uh, thank all of them very much for their efforts and, and making this uh, happen. Okay, great. And the final thing I want to say is uh, we plan to do this next year. So uh, we would love to see all of you back, but also uh, for any of you who are interested in, in participating, in, in um, helping with the, with the, the organizing planning committee, uh, also we uh, would like to um, thank again our sponsors, 
um, that you can see on the, on the back of the program from um, all over the country, institutions, uh, and we thank them for their support. If you're ever interested in, in possibly uh, having your institution be a sponsor or, or helping this, uh, this conference extend and, and grow, then um, please contact me. And if you want to be involved, please contact me. And we will also be sending out more detailed information on um, possible publication of some of the papers that are presented. So um, enjoy your lunch, and thank you very much. Short notice. My pleasure. I thought that was pretty remarkable for being on such short notice. Yeah. Hi, 6 30? 6 30. Okay. And I will call you if I end up being somewhere else.